mostly cloudy down in Chimney. Partly cloudy up here in the mountains. Beautiful day. Although, just got some cloud cover right here. And over there, behind me, you can see the peaks uh, I've been hiking up towards. But I'm actually at the summit of my little hike today. And we're gonna ride back down to right up to Chimney. Peace. That was 39-year-old Leighton Bromley Dory IV. On this early April 2017 day, he is skiing in the Argentier Ski Resort in Chamonix, France, which is right along the border with Switzerland. A Pennsylvania native, Leighton is having the time of his life. He's lived in Europe for the past four years. He's an adventurer with a nice little business and software which allows him to work remotely. It also helps that he has wealthy parents to enjoy life's pleasures. But Leighton is masking a troubling secret. This skiing video has been memorialized on his Facebook page, fittingly because it will be the last time he will set foot in France. The next month, Leighton will pack his bags and leave his lodging in France. He's got a highly anticipated visit with his father and stepmother at their California ranch next week. This is the story of the Dories. San Diego, situated in the south, the big state of California, it is consistently ranked in the top 10 most expensive U.S. cities to live in. A rocket mortgage survey from February has it at number 7 most expensive in the country, with a median household income of $83,000, a median home price of $837,000, and a median monthly rent of $1,770. It has a cost of living that is 60% higher than the national average. It's got everything. Lots of shopping centers, entertainment, museums, and outdoor amenities to enjoy in its moderate climate. Here in San Diego resides the affluent residential community of Rancho Santa Fe, nicknamed The Ranch. It has a population of 3156 as of the 2020 census. It is marked by huge homes, nature reserves, beaches, parks, you name it, this place has it. It is here that our story takes us. Leighton Bromley Dory III was born on October 12, 1945 in Abington, Pennsylvania to Margaret and Leighton Dory. He went to Abington High School in Abington and attended the Staunton Military Academy in Virginia, where he graduated in 1963 and served in the active and reserve Coast Guard. He went on to study textile science at Philadelphia Textile College. His family's wealth came from the textile industry, where he landed his first line of work. He is said to have built his reputation for innovative dyeing techniques as a manager of wool dye houses. But his real skill and passion was in real estate. In his late 20s, he started working in that industry and established his own real estate brokerage firm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, a jurisdiction with stately old homes easily in the $1 million plus valuation. He climbed up the industry to become the president of the board of realtors. Quote, the realty business in Springtown was one that was highly respected and admired because of his standards, said a person who knew him. Layton was married to a woman named Carol in Pennsylvania. They had two children together, Alarine and Layton Dory IV, who I will refer to as Layton Jr. The Dorys were doing well financially. In fact, it is reported that Carol would tell people that it would take her three minutes to drive the length of her driveway on her stone farm house which is on a 110 acre plot of land. It took her longer to get out of her driveway than it did to get to her office, which was two minutes away from the main road. In 1993, 48 year old Layton Sr. and Carol divorced, with Carol taking over the real estate business in Pennsylvania. That same year, Layton Sr. met a woman named Kimberly Ann, who had two adult daughters from a previous marriage. By now, Lane Sr. had moved out west to Rancho Santa Fe in San Diego, where in 1998, he started another real estate business called the Leighton Dory Real Estate Brokerage of Rancho Santa Fe. 
The next year, Lane Sr. and Kimberly married, and he moved into Kim's longtime Rancho Santa Fe residence. That home would need to be rebuilt after it was destroyed in the Witch Creek Fire of 2007, which damaged or destroyed over 80 homes. So Lane Sr. retired in 2008 to focus on the rebuild, but still managed properties. The property at 17221 La Brisa had a unique location on a canyon across from a golf course with a pond and a stream on the property. Around the early 90s, Layton Sr. was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer and was given months to live. Quote, I took responsibility for creating my cancer and with proper medicine and actions on my part, I have been healthy since, he said in a classmates.com post. Layton Sr. was a bit of a renaissance man. He seemed to know a little bit of everything and dabbled in various activities. He was known as a horticulturalist, a hiker, a naturalist, and was known as a person who got things done when they needed to be done. He was an accomplished gymnast when he was younger and kept in shape throughout his entire life. At 71, he was 5 feet 7 inches tall and 152 pounds. He was known as an intellectual, a philosopher, an educator, a man of principle and integrity, and a seeker of objectivity. In a classmates.com post, Lane Sr. said he refrained from watching TV and sought books to elevate his mind, including Aldous Huxley's Island, his utopian manifesto. On a gray Tuesday morning, May 30, 2017, Lane Sr. and his wife Kimberly emerged from their slumber before 5.30 a.m., before the sun broke the horizon. Lane Sr. was in his office to handle something about the apartments in Pennsylvania he still managed. Then, he and Kimberly had their regular morning coffee together and planned their day. As per usual, Lane Sr. would tend to the crops on the land. He loved gardening. This morning called for a cloth barrier around the trees to protect them against the birds, so they both worked on that. Kimberly then had to take Brandy, their old German shepherd, to the vet in Encinitas at 9 a.m. This couple was a strong two-person unit and worked together to get tasks done efficiently. Because Brandy had hip dysplasia, she had a difficult time moving around and, in this case, climbing into cars. So, Lane Sr. helped Kimberly put the dog in the car. He then went inside to make himself breakfast and Kimberly was off to the vet. At around 11am, Kim made a 20-second call to her husband and told him that the vet appointment ran longer than expected but that she would be home in 20 minutes. He said, great. When she got home, she noticed a black Jeep renegade in the driveway and the three garage doors were closed. Her husband normally opened the garage doors every morning to air it out. They were opened when she left for the vet. She shrugged it off, parked the car, got the vet paperwork, her purse, and other miscellaneous items and went inside and plopped them on the counter. I'm home. The house was eerily quiet. No matter, Leighton likely didn't hear her. She went back outside to grab Brandy and placed her in her bed in the kitchen. She tried again. Layton, I'm home. Nothing. She then tried calling him to ask where he was, and if he went to lunch to let her know where he went so she could catch up. No answer, so she left a voicemail. And she called several more times, but he didn't pick up. Kimberly tried not to panic. She would just do a careful go around the house. Maybe Layton didn't hear her. She first went upstairs to the master bedroom. Nothing. Then she went back downstairs and went to the vegetable garden to see if he was in a sitting area. Nope. Then she went back inside and descended into the downstairs guest apartment. Her anxiety began to rise, and her heart was racing. She's now visibly shaking. If a pin fell on a carpet floor, she could hear it. It was dead quiet. She now began to speed walk around the basement for 10 minutes, frantically checking every room. The combination of her anxiety rising and the physical movement kicked her body into full-on adrenaline mode. She raced back upstairs, repeatedly calling Layton's name. Layton! Layton! She went to the only part of the house left, the guest bedroom and bathroom located near her office, where there was a little carpeted hallway near the stairs. As she walked into the room, she saw him. Layton Sr. was lying on the floor, face up. His face was completely disfigured. Kimberly thought he'd been shot in the face. Layton Sr. was dead. 
Layton Sr.'s son, Layton Dory IV, referred from now on as Junior, was born in 1977 when his father was 31 years old. Junior went to Saucon Valley High School in Hellerton, Pennsylvania, where he graduated in 1996. Classmates referred to Junior in Facebook posts as, quote, nice and friendly. After graduating from high school, he went to Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and then Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, 32 miles east of Los Angeles. He studied to become a software developer and programmer. He held several brief jobs, including as Flash developer at Women Heart, Midnight Oil Creative, MySpace, Grab Games, Six Degrees Games, Enhanced Digital, U Star Entertainment Group, and Pearson Education. All those positions lasted less than two years, according to his LinkedIn page. In February 2014, he was finally free from the shackles of desk work when he got a remote software engineering job at Clear Markets, where he worked on a derivatives trading application. He worked at this position for just over a year. He also started working in September 2014 to create an e-commerce software application for a company called the Orange County Booklet, which made custom printed booklets wherein customers can upload digital artwork and make their own. Just like his personal website, the e-commerce website currently just does not work. The e-commerce business was the last position noted on his profile, which includes the following blurb in the About section. Quote, I enjoy building applications that make life more comfortable and convenient. In one recommendation he received on LinkedIn, a person named Elizabeth Harrington said the following, Layton is one of those eclectic geniuses that are too few and far between. He is smart, funny, and I thoroughly enjoyed every day I got to work with him. He is a great problem solver and jumps right into any situation, even if it means he needs to learn a new programming language to accomplish it. He has a great eye and brought our designs to life while still retaining the integrity and subtleties of the artwork. On top of that, you can't beat working with someone who reminds you to get outside and get some sunshine each day. On an overcast and cool Friday morning, May 26, 2017, four days before Senior's death, Kimberly Dory was working on the vegetable garden when, out of nowhere, Junior appeared. Kimberly was surprised. Junior, she thought, was in France. Four years earlier, Junior moved to the Republic since he was now able to work remotely. The two exchanged pleasantries as Junior played with Brandy, who came racing after him as he neared the front door. Junior came in a new black Jeep Renegade. Kimberly asked him if he wanted to see Senior, and he said yes. The two walked through the courtyard to the front door. When they got in, Kim shouted to the second floor that Junior was here. Senior, surprised but delighted, said he'd be right down. The two men hugged, and Senior took him to an outdoor seating area to catch up. Kimberly went to bring in some harvested vegetables. After she was done washing the vegetables, Kimberly joined the men in the seating area. Junior came with some good news. He was looking to return to California and settle down, specifically in Los Angeles. The news was music to their ears. They could now see Junior more often. After a bit more chatting, Junior said he had to go, and Senior made sure that Kimberly got his phone number so they could grab lunch. Junior texted his dad's phone number to ensure he had it. As Junior got into his car, his dad hollered, I love you. Kimberly called 911 that Tuesday, May 30, 2017. She was shaking and sobbing uncontrollably. She was asked if anyone was on the property recently, and she said her stepson, Lane Jr., but didn't know who would hurt Lane Sr. She relayed to police that she did see Lane Jr.'s Jeep in the driveway this morning, but when she looked out the window after calling Lane Sr.'s name, it was gone. She assumed that the two had gone to lunch, that's when she left those messages urging her husband to let her know if they were going to lunch so she could join them. The only person the San Diego County Sheriff's Office could target for now was the son. Detective Darren Parada set up a fugitive task force to mobilize and find the perpetrator. Darren was able to get Junior's cell number from Carroll in Pennsylvania. They got information that the phone was pinging at the parking lot of a Murrieta police station, but when officers got there, Junior wasn't there. Then Darren asked Kimberly if she owned any other properties at which Junior could be located, and she said yes, at her cabin in Idlewild in Riverside County. The cabin was a roughly two hour drive north 
about 90 miles in the San Jacinto Mountains. It was a cabin that Kimberly inherited from her parents. On a dark night at 8 p.m., the task force made its way to the mountains in Idlewild. They found the Jeep parked between two homes. Inside the Jeep was a suitcase, clothing, and stuff that made detectives and police think Junior was living out of the car. So they surveilled the vehicle from a distance and waited for him to emerge. At 7 a.m. the next morning, Junior appeared. He was walking along the road wearing layers of clothing with one of those hiking backpacks that rise above the head. The bag had two straps, one for his waist and one for his head to keep secure. When he got to his car, the police swooped in and nabbed him. They believed they had probable cause to arrest him. A search of the vehicle found blood on the steering wheel with the DNA of Layton Sr. The seat adjustment lever of the front passenger seat also had Sr.'s blood on it. This was an extremely violent crime. We were ordered to tile the face of Leighton Dory IV while he was in court. A muscular man, he stood immobile, his piercing eyes darting around the courtroom as he was arraigned on a murder charge for the death of his father Tuesday at his estate in Rancho Santa Fe. We can only describe this, Your Honor, as a brutal and savage attack. The lifeless body of Leighton Dory III was discovered in a back room when his wife returned from a brief errand that morning. He had been severely beaten and choked. That Tuesday morning, when Senior was making his breakfast and before Kimberly left for the vet, Senior told her he would call Junior to see if he wanted to get lunch. She said she would be available at noon or tomorrow at 5 for a get-together. When Kimberly called at 11 a.m. to tell her husband that she was running late, he told her that Junior was here at the residence. Within 15 minutes, Senior would be dead. Kimberly testified in court that she was afraid of Junior and what he would do to her and her husband. She alleged that she overheard phone calls between Junior and her husband and it was copied on emails between the two men in which Junior said that Kimberly should kill Senior or Senior should kill Kimberly. She said that she long suspected Junior of having mental health issues and that he was possibly a paranoid schizophrenic. She said in one email, Junior said that he believed the dentist planted a device in his tooth. In another, Junior told one of Kimberly's daughters that Kimberly and his dad tried to poison him in 2013. And in still another email, Junior said he believed his dad wanted him dead and gone, and that he didn't want him on his inheritance. According to Kimberly's testimony, Junior had claimed that he heard sounds and voices at night, and they made it difficult for him to sleep. Neighbors of the Dorries, who were psychiatrists, worried that Junior might have been bipolar. No one knows exactly what Junior did to Senior that morning, but the medical examiner testifying at Junior's court hearing for two hours in April 2018 gave theoretical possibilities as to what happened based on the evidence. She also answered prosecutor questions about the possible violence used. According to that testimony, it is likely that after getting into a dispute, the six foot tall, 180 pound Junior suddenly turned animalistic and struck five foot, seven inch tall, 152 pound Senior's face multiple times with his right hand, which broke after repeated strikes, as you can see from the swelling of his hand. Then he dragged Senior to a staircase near where he was later found, put his boot foot on his hand possibly to stop him from resisting, grabbed the back of his head and bashed it against the stairs. The medical examiner said she didn't see injuries to the back of his head. The medical examiner also affirmed that it was possible Junior stomped on Senior's body, causing the fractured spine and ribs. The examiner noted that skin was torn from Senior's hands, his teeth were found strewn around the room, and blood covered the walls. He had a broken nose, a broken jaw, and a fractured spine, ribs, and neck. Both his ears, on which he wore hearing aids, were bruised. But that wasn't enough for Junior. At the scene, investigators observed a broken belt buckle, which belonged to Senior. Medical examiner said it was a possibility that Junior strangled Senior with his own belt. Medical examiner affirmed that it could have taken less than a minute after the strangulation began for Senior to die. The cause of death was both strangulation and blunt force injuries, all of which contributed to his death, the examiner said adding she couldn't say how long it took for him to die. The prosecutors charged Junior with murder with special circumstance of torture. Quote, even the most seasoned homicide detectives called the homicide 
one of the most brutal crime scenes they've ever come across, Prosecutor Paul Greenwood said. Junior initially told his mother Carol that he was going to turn himself in that day to a police station in Marietta, information which she relayed to police. But he told the court he just couldn't do it and left to the mountains to have one more day of freedom. The question left to answer is why? When Junior told his parents that he was coming to settle down in California, he was actively looking for a job in Los Angeles. In fact, on the day that Senior was murdered, he was apparently supposed to have a job interview in that city. But in reality, Junior didn't want a job, according to prosecutors, which was the cause of tension between him and his father. A lot of the two's conversations dating back to at least 2013 was about money. Despite paying $20,000 for Junior's dental treatment and some extra for drug rehab, Senior essentially told Junior to take a hike when he asked for a regular $1,000 per month allowance. In one email, Junior, who also had unpaid taxes, had requested $7,000 per year. He also requested that his father invest in his quote, money multiplying software. Junior threatened Senior if he didn't comply. All his demands were rebuffed. According to Kimberly, whenever Senior would finish a phone call with Junior, he would become tense and withdrawn. She said in his last phone call with his son, Junior asked his dad if he would pick him up from the airport and rent him a car. Senior agreed to pick him up, but not rent him a car. Junior testified that he was having trouble finding stable work while living overseas. In fact, it was Carol, his biological mother in Pennsylvania, who purchased his plane ticket back to San Diego and bought him his new Jeep. Junior couldn't even afford to stay in his San Diego hotel for the few days he was in the state, instead opting to live in the Jeep. Quote, the relationship between the father and son was fractious, said Prosecutor Paul. Junior argued in court that this had nothing to do with money because his biological mother, Carol, wired him $1,200 a month and paid his rent in France. Junior said that while the killing was wrong, he was only defending himself against Senior, who he said was a true aggressor. He said he wanted to discuss the alleged poisoning attempt on him by his father in 2013, but his father did not want to discuss any such matter and subsequently pointed at a painting of Junior as a boy and said he preferred to remember that version of his son. Junior alleged at some point, as he bent down to tie his shoes, Senior began choking him with his belt and proclaimed, now you're dead. Junior alleged that Senior would beat him when he was a kid for not doing his chores. Junior claimed that the two scuffled after the botched choking attempt and that he eventually killed Senior by putting him in a sleeper hold. He then tried to stage the scene as a suicide, but then changed his mind and tried to make it appear like his father fell down the stairs. In September 2019, one Vista jury member did not agree to the first degree murder charge against Junior, resulting in an 11 to 1 hung jury. That's because murder convictions require unanimity. But a jury found him unanimously guilty a second time around in June 2022. On May 25, 2023, Leighton Bromley Dory IV was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Leighton Jr. was desperate and thought he was entitled to his dad's money. That's an obviously dangerous combination, if it is to be believed that he also had mental health issues. Kimberly said it was her belief that Carol herself arranged for him to see a mental health professional in Los Angeles years ago after an incident in which he said he heard voices, but it's unclear if he ever went. James Robertson, a person claiming to be a classmate of Leighton Sr.'s on his obituary page, said, Oh, how a horrible way to die, James said in his tribute. Friend, I mourn your loss, but I will cherish my memories of better times with you. Another compared Leighton's death to a Greek tragedy. Quote, that after striving for and finding peace and happiness, he should meet this end. Remember, Lane Sr. was a literature buff who loved books and exploring ideas in those books. Lane was a man of letters, said yet another obituary post. Quote, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles.
Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story. As usual, this story is based on secondary and primary sources, including court reports. Special thanks to the reporters who cover these stories and bring them to the public, and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter and providing feedback. Just so you guys are aware, there is a vision where I would get some primary source information from the police department in order to incorporate in the videos. So uh, those are on an active basis, uh, and I'll try to bring those um, as sort of exclusive to the channel and to the videos. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, as always, please be safe. And of course, please, don't be late in Dory the Fourth.